Australasian Cochrane Centre, and it's uh, my privilege to chair this last session. Our first speaker this afternoon is Chris Mavergains. Uh, Chris, as most of you will know, is the director... I have to get the new title right. He's the director of um, Information Technology and Knowledge Management Functions, um, head of Informatics and Knowledge Management of the Cochrane Collaboration. Sorry, Chris. Um, but much more important than that to this audience and certainly to me, um, Chris had a... a very big birthday just before he made the very big effort of coming, so happy birthday belatedly. And he is the, the 2010 recipient of the Chris Salaji Prize. So welcome, Chris. Thank you for coming all this way. Okay, I mean, we're pressed for time, so I'm just starting my stopwatch. Thank you, Sally. Thank you, Steve, for inviting me to speak. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. I'll try to move quickly. Um, some of you might have seen some of these slides before in Quebec. It's pretty conceptual, high-level talk because it's about the future of knowledge. Ooh, you know, it's pretty, uh, pretty crazy. And um, the subtitle is hashtag Cochrane Tech to 2020, which you might have heard um, Julian mention yesterday was a symposium that we held. But it also represents a um, symbolically the, the direction we're taking of being, having a more external focus to the world and the uh, hashtag Cochrane Tech is sort of the machines and the technology and the process having a more external focus. Conflicts of interest really quick. I am an employee of the Cochrane Collaboration. I have a heavy bias in that I think technology and knowledge management can further transform our work and move us toward a vision of improved health for all. So I'm going to take you on a journey today from uh, escaping containers to uh, talking about being nimble uh, a specific technology called linked data to being user-centered and a little bit about the future. So predicting the future, tricky stuff. Uh, 1968, Stanley Kubrick, uh, Arthur Clarke, um, film 2001, they said by 2001 we would be speaking to robots and although we have RevMan Hal that we're kind of starting to, to toy with, um, essentially we're at this point right now where when you ask Siri what's the meaning of life, she says, I don't know but I think there's an app for that. So, you know, Tricky stuff, but you know we're getting there slowly. Um, knowledge management is about people, process, and technology, and I wanted to throw this up here right at the beginning. Um, that that while I'm, you know, a techie, uh, it's actually I think in the people and process elements of, of all of this are just as important, and in some ways more important than the technology. You have to get the people and process right, and then match technological solutions to that. And Cochrane in the knowledge pyramid um, exists um, here at the top in the organized contextual and aids decision making realm in the, in the processes that we use. And so the question is future of knowledge, you know, how can we do what we're doing better? How can we conceptualize what we do and how we deliver what we do um, better to our users? And um, fundamentally, if you take um, nothing away from my talk today, uh, I want you to think about what it means to escape containers and what it means to think outside of the container and the document view of what we do. And we do have a very document-centric view of what we do. We didn't start out that way, but we do. We currently take very ironically structured XML and produce documents out of it when the, actually the XML structure is more meaningful than the documents that we produce. And, uh, you know, everywhere around the world, every day, someone decides they might want the full text of what we do. Who wouldn't want the full of, of anything? And the longest review in the Cochrane Library currently is 785 pages. And so if, they don't, if they're not careful, this is, uh, if they have enough paper, this is what they'll end up with. Which is really a shame because the key components, the knowledge um, that, that, that is in, uh, in our reviews and that's available across the reviews is kind of locked in this container view of what we do. And so... Um, I hate clip art, but, uh, you know, blue clip art people just want to uh, get information to help them make a decision and sort of check out. And this is just playing, me playing around in Photoshop, but, um, you know, it's, I think it's um, instructive for us to imagine what would, a, you know, a Cochrane Evidence browser look like? What would you want to browse by? Not documents, but the actual knowledge within the documents. Pico would probably be a good, a good candidate. Um, what other information would you want to bring in or see in the context of what we do? And so just to show this to kind of think conceptually, but it's also a point to make about, about mobile devices. Um, phones, tablets, and a new term I heard recently, phablet, which are these phones that are so big they're almost tablets. But um, <laughs> uh, we don't, what's our phablet strategy, Mark? We don't have. <laughs> um, but it, it's interesting, this, it was predicted a few years ago that the inflection point would literally be now um, that, uh, that the mo number of mobile users would exceed desktop users and it would just go like this. 
So on the road to 2020, there might, there might not be desktops anymore. There might not be the notion of even laptops. It might be some other sort of device that, that people are constantly on the move with. And I think that's already happening. And you know, Wiley and, um, and the editorial unit are making progress in this. This is a, a, um, a screenshot of something called the Anywhere article, which will be released early next year. Looking at Deborah, okay. Um, and this is a fully responsive view of the document of, of the Cochrane Review that works on any device and in any operating system and reconfigures itself to work on the device that you're using. But it's still, you know, the document view of what we do. So the question is, how do we become nimble? So how can we, not how can we write reviews standing on our head, but um, how can we become more flexible in how we, how we disseminate our information? And nimble is an adjective, of course, that most of you probably know, but it's also the name of a, of a white paper um, by a person called Rachel Lovinger about the future of digital publishing. And she tells a really nice story, you can get this on, on the web as well, um, if you just Google nimble paper, um, about how structured and linked data can help make content nimble. And she has the three principles of nimble, our nimble content travels freely. And this is important, this is not is free necessarily. It means it's about the context, the user, the device, and the kind of the way they need to interact with it. It retains the context meaning, which I think is most important for Cochrane. To me, this is the kind of methodological piece. You don't want to pull things out of containers and re-put them in different contexts and people can't understand the meaning. And it helps us create new products, which is in an open access world is you know, really important. So when I think about how I would conceptualize what would nimble Cochrane content look like, I mean, this would be an extreme version of that. But if in PubMed there was a Cochrane button that's, that when you hovered over it, it said this was one of 17 studies assessed in a Cochrane review, go read the review here, that would be massively helpful to not only us, but perhaps to readers and to, to get across our message. But it's actually also a part of the review. It tells you how many studies were in the review and that this was one of them. But likewise, if you had a study record in PubMed that, that you could see the context, uh, in context the risk of bias score, I mean, this is all technologically possible, but it, we just would have to think differently about how our the knowledge in our reviews would move. And interestingly, we've started to get requests for sort of nimble Cochrane content. Altmetrics, which was mentioned this morning by Nancy, have uh, approached Wiley about how they could license the risk of bias score to create a Cochrane score for their metrics, because they're looking to expand beyond just social media metrics. There was a Hungarian startup that um, wrote last year saying that they were doing a diabetes, uh, creating a diabetes management system, and they wanted to know if we had our stuff in computable format, linked data format said, well, we're working on it, but we don't have it yet. There's also something called Open Facts that have approached us recently about a project they're doing about evidence-based drug interactions, um, a Wiley journal looking to use the implications for research. And I think there are going to be others following because essentially the, the document view of what we do is not, not really accurate um, in terms of how people receive the value inside of the, the containers. And so Cochrane Clinical Answers is a derivative product we started to develop that, um, that we're developing that is looking at uh, making the content more nimble, breaking it down into pieces so that people can digest it easier, and um, very soon these will be linked to from reviews. But what I would argue is it's a start, but many users and many talks at this, uh, at this um, in symposium, uh, Davina's um, uh, this morning in particular, users need to navigate our stuff in ways we don't currently offer, right? They have, they have questions where they need to look across reviews and analyses, and it's very difficult. So how can we make our content nimble? And this is where a specific um, uh, technological development that's happened in the last five, 10 years called linked data um, is going to make this possible. So to, to sort of go really quickly through what linked data is, um, it's uh, without getting too technical, uh, the, the current web that we all experience is a web of documents, right? You move between documents. The, the documents are linked, not the things in the documents, but it's actually things that we're interested in, right? We just use documents to move and learn about things. Um, sadly, the Cochrane Library is not even a web of documents. So we can really make a huge step just by sort of linking the documents, but I would argue that we need to make even, even already the next step in linking the things. And the inventor of the World Wide Web, Tim Berners-Lee, put it this way. He said, the realization behind the creation of the internet was that it wasn't the cables, it was the computers that are interesting. When you move on to the web, you say, well, actually, the computers, I don't really care where the computer is, I just want the document so that I can learn about things. But the next sort of leap, conceptual leap now, is actually, I don't really care about documents, I just want to learn about things, and I want to put um, connections together between things. 
And the way that I conceptualize this, just to do a, a non-health example, I think Julian mentioned yesterday, is sort of, it's a start anywhere, go anywhere, anywhere information architecture. So if you have, this is a person called Mark Garneau. He's an astronaut from Quebec. I gave this talk in, in, in uh, Canada first. Uh, his birthplace is Quebec City, he, which is part of Canada, which hosted the 2010 Winter Olympics, which was held in Vancouver. Vancouver is included in the list of most livable cities in the world. It's number three. So is Melbourne. It's number one. And this is what's called a directed labeled graph. And it allows you to to do, do a sort of graph of knowledge, um, making connections between things, and, and it's underpinned by lots of technologies that have acronyms that I'm not gonna talk about, but it allows you to discover connections between things more easily. And so I think that what we need is an architecture like this for our users that would allow them to come in at you know, a study, see the intervention in the study, started a review and move between the studies that included it back to the intervention, see which conditions it treats, and then link to external things like side effects resources, which are available. And they are available actually as linked data because we've done it in our demonstrator site. And so what we're talking about moving to is not only moving away from documents, but kind of moving back to the original intent of the Cochrane database of systematic reviews was that it was a database and about creating these kind of graphs of knowledge so that we can allow people to navigate our content and knowledge in ways that are more meaningful, but also to package it in ways that people can, um, it can be more useful to people. And it's all about PICO. So when we started out in the linked data project that we started about a year and a half ago, we were looking at studies and reviews, we were looking at connections between studies and reviews, and what, you know, what it all comes down to is PICO. And the PICO, um, you can't really read this, but the PICO model that we were building, that we're actually going to be revisiting next month, um, really is what underpins everything, and it's really what people, how people are dipping into our world to try to get information out. And so when we built the um, demonstrator site, which you can all go have a play with, Julian mentioned it yesterday, um, we were connecting documents, and so you can make nice journeys between studies and reviews, and you can do a little bit with the eye, so with the uh, interventions that are available. But we really realized that actually what we need to do is take a step back and get Pico right, and then we can start to stitch together all of the... Uh, all of the knowledge that's available across our, our content. So we're in the process right now of sort of, I would say, making it real. So we have funding from the steering group to do um, the linked data project for real and really start to make it happen. And we d we've decided to start with Cochrane Clinical Answers, which is a derivative product we're already working on. And how can we, one of the problems with getting it to market is that it takes a long time to write these clinical answers because you have to get the content out of the reviews to populate them. And so originally, there was a um, thing called the Picotron, which was a project to semi-automate the populating of these clinical answers. It's a script written by a guy called Ian Marshall. It extracts information from the reviews and reconfigures the titles into questions, pulls data from the XML, and you know, does all sorts of stuff to, to, to get it in the format that they can start to write the clinical answers from. But the problem is, and you can see here from the Picotron output, if you look there at the Pico at the top, it's, it's empty because we actually have no meaningful way to predict and get the PICO information out of the review. We can get lots of other information, but it's very sort of rough and ready, but it was better than nothing. So we said, well, why don't we do a PICOTRON 2.0, but use linked data. We can do a semantic tagging of reviews at title and analysis level, so all the comparisons, and then we can have an improved creation for clinical answers. But in exploring this use case, there, was, there were all sorts of, well, then you could re reuse the tags at the study level and put them in the CRS. You could facilitate network meta-analysis. You could uh, enable guideline developers and other researchers to, to, to see these things as research objects, so a PICO question in isolation, and pull together the analyses around those. And sort of, um, there's just lots of knock-on uh, effects of this. And so that's what we're looking to do. And, uh, and when we were discussing this, we were talking about overviews and network meta-analysis. And this is a slide from Georgia Salanti. You know, one of the, fir the first step of, of doing that process is trying to, to draw this map, right? And you wanna know things like there have been no trials comparing these two drugs available in Cochrane reviews. Well, linked data can actually make this very easy to do. And so if that can help with that first step, then perhaps it will help in, in, in sort of making it more real further down the line. So for me, it's in, in summary, again, I think it's, it's, it's about adding the D back into the CDSR and conceptualizing it as the database it was originally intended to be, 
instead of a database of documents, an actual database that you can get the knowledge out of. And so this thing that we call you know, a systematic review that's conceptualized as a PDF is really, we really have 5,600, however many we have at this point, databases. And if we conceptualize each review as a database, and, you, and then you imagine connecting all of the databases up in a, in a web of data, then the queries and the kinds of views that you can give people onto it are much more meaningful. And just to point out that you know, we exist in a larger ecosystem of, which is, this is where we exist, from electronic medical registers and, and individual patient data through this whole ecosystem. And if we have our stuff more connected, and if we're using linked data approaches, we can better connect to other, other users of our information. Do you have to be careful with methods? Um, there are occasionally cows that fall off roads onto cars, apparently. But um, uh, very, very mindful of, uh, of what it means to think outside of the container, what it means to create new views onto data and new views onto aggregating information. So not going to hopefully, and we're going to be very careful not to make any mistakes there as we move forward. And that's where it's very important to work with the network of people that we have and the processes that we use to pair with the technology. So I'm just gonna wrap up with a couple of comments, um, if possible, about the future. Again, very difficult to do. But for me, one of the most important things about our strategy, that's probably the most important thing, is us taking a more user-centered focus in what we do. That we don't always look at the way we view the world and how we think the information that we've put together should be presented. That we actually go to users, guideline, policy, clinician, all of our users, and we try to understand their needs and what the questions that they're trying to answer and how we either do or don't you know, facilitate the answering of those questions. So that's, that underpins the future, I think. And then once you start from there, then you look at crazy diagrams like this from Nova Spivak saying, you know, this is the direction that the web is heading. It's about the intelligence and the connections. It's about connecting people with information. And our success should be judged on how well we do that, not how well we format PDFs or how well we structure documents. So ultimately, what we want by 2030 or sooner is we just want one big refresh button, right? We just want to say, we have all these questions and refresh and get a coffee in the morning and say, is there any new evidence? Well, I think you can start to see that that's not such a crazy vision. Um, Paul, I hope you don't mind that I took a picture of you. But um, if we can get the submit button at the beginning going, right? And then at the end, with, this is Len Brandt's guideline robot. Um, <laughs> uh, and you can start to put the pieces together in between. And you can start to see the entire thing becoming semi-automated, systemized, still using people, of course, but in, in really um, effective processes and uh, connecting it all together. But one of the first steps will be to kind of think beyond the PDF. And that's not my phrase. There was a conference in Amsterdam earlier this year called Beyond the PDF. So lots of people are thinking about how we break out of these containers in scientific publishing and meet users' needs better. And so it's, it's about all sorts of stuff like this and including things we can't imagine yet. But I think for Cochrane, one of the most important parts is the notion of computable documents, of data publishing, of using application program, programming interfaces, and something called nano publications, which I have no time to get into. But I thought I would just name drop these things, and you can Google them if you want. There's also a question about linked open data, uh, apropos Lisa's talk. Um, you know, if we're moving open access, at some point, we might want to be thinking about how we make our data open in a controlled way, in a structured way. Um, and just to sort of also point out, that is also part of moving beyond the PDF. And there are frameworks emerging where you can think differently about how documents are structured, how scholarly communication happens. Research Object Project is, is I think, a really um, pertinent one for us. It's this idea that you can package together research objects instead of entire papers. So a PICO question with its analyses could be a research object. And then you can annotate those with rich metadata, with provenance metadata, everything, and sort of package those out as needed for users and um, uh, in, in a more contextual way. And so, so it's, it's promising to see that some of these things are emerging. They're using linked data approaches. So the question is how we interact with that. And I think we might need to also think about evolving who we are um, I don't want to get rid of the term systematic review or author, but maybe add to it like data curators, data visualizers, data scientists. Data scientists is this um, definition here, which is about combining the skills of statistician, programmer, graphic designer, and storyteller. I mean, we already have a lot of those skills. And I think it's interesting to think about how we might move in that direction. How am I doing? Done? Okay.
Thanks.